Oh boy. It's just, oh, each day is like a whole other adventure and experience. I mean, I have come out of this almost sine wave, I mean, especially during uh, the coup of just every day pretty much blurring in to the next. And now everything is like, each day is a whole adventure uh, and trying to change how I live and what I'm doing here. And I don't know, can you find, is there such a thing as purpose? I mean, we are doing these, I am doing these shows and doing art and it really, I mean, a hundred years from now, Yes, Frank is preserving this, and I really hope, as I've said before, that there's somebody uh, in this far-flung future who is listening like I listened to Gene Shepard or Vickensade and saying, ha, huh, this is interesting, and the, getting something out of it, this struggling kook who lived in some past time in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, who reaches out to the world, uh, I don't know. But all that aside, the other day uh, we played that song, Indian Love Call. I believe it was on uh, number 29 in this series. Uh, and I mentioned Slim Whitman, who recorded that song. And that just brought back these memories of uh, in the 70s before, you know, CDs and all this other stuff. While you were watching your television during the ads, you would be deluged with these offers of collections of music of people like Slim Whitman, who actually, especially over in Europe, was one of the biggest selling recording artists of all time, along with... Uh, if, if you remember back then, the master of the pan flute, Zamfir, who was also just relentlessly hawked. And, uh, yep, there's Slim Whitman, when I go back, at least some of his songs from the 50s, I mean, it really seems like a lot of the country stars, they had a more rough-hewn sound and then started adding strings and orchestration and smoothed everything out. Um, but the early stuff of Slim Whitman and people like Hank Snow, as opposed to their later stuff, to me it's just so, it has a real gritty resonance that uh, the early country, early blues, uh, I, I love that original guys on the porch or a few guys getting together and playing in an auditorium somewhere in Tennessee for a dance and just having a good time. I mean, and you used to get more of that when, as I was growing up, but commercial country, I mean, what it's become now, I mean, now it's if rock and rollish. I mean, did the pedal steel guitar and that cowboy sound, for example. Um, it's just, well, the dark country that I've mentioned has a little feel of that, that, I don't know, spaghetti western sound, for lack of a better term. But, uh, yeah, Slim Whitman uh, just apparently took old songs, made them his own, and, and he, he yodeled along the lines of the father of country music, Another of my favorites, Jimmy Rogers, uh, the yodeling brakeman, who only recorded for a few years. The guy, apparently, even when he started, had tuberculosis, which was prevalent in the day, and they didn't have medicines to treat it. And that poor guy just kept going. He had a family to support. And even as a very successful recording artist back then, I don't, I, to, to, was the record company making a, probably the record company was making a lot of money, but uh, a recording artist like Jimmy Rogers, here he was sick, dying of tuberculosis, and he felt it 
incumbent upon himself. He spent his last days on this planet. He traveled to New York City to record a few more records so there would be money for his wife and his kids after he passed. And he would record in the studio and lay down on a cot between takes. His body was so ravaged by this tuberculosis. or They, they didn't call it consumption for nothing, and that's really what they called it. And he even did a couple of songs about having TB and that he was fighting it. Um, I got the T he would sing and things like that. I mean, and this is like a genuine form of country music. Um, and he, he would uh, do these boast songs like Pistol Packing Papa. But yes, yeah, Slim Whitman came from that school and probably was one of the later proponents. Hank Snow actually was assisted in his early career by the widow of Jimmy Rogers. Um, it all connects somehow. That's, that's really what is most interesting and fascinates me, is how everything sort of ties back together like a good Gene Shepard program. Um, and, and, and other bands that have a billion connections, the Yardbirds, they were just a blues revival band playing the music that in the United States, I mean, we didn't, we were listening to rock and roll and they were finding these old American blues records. I mean, that's what the Rolling Stones came out of. And the Yardbirds uh, originally had Eric Clapton as a guitarist. And this is uh, the young, purest Eric Clapton, who when the Yardbirds finally started getting hits and started moving towards more poppy music, said, no, that's not for me. And he went off and played with another great blues revivalist, John Mayo, for a couple of years, and then went on, of course, to do a Blind Faith and um, Cream uh, with Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. Um, all these progressions. And then the uh, second Yardbirds guitarist was Jeff Beck, who, if you're a guitar aficionado at all, was quite the amazing guitarist, also out of the blues, but also kind of a jazz artist. And he later moved into uh, what they called fusion jazz in the 70s and 80s and on. And uh, before his recent death, actually was incorporating uh, electronica and um, techno I mean, not techno, but that electric dance music into some of his work. Um, he was willing to go the distance, but he clung to his roots and his style. And of course, the uh, final guitarist for the late Yardbirds was Jimmy Page, who somehow wound up inheriting the whole band and went on tour as the new Yardbirds. Uh, and they quickly, in the late 60s, developed into a little ensemble called Led Zeppelin, who also plumbed the depths and literally stole <laughs> stuff from the blues legends. And all this meanwhile, we had the blues, but that was mostly listened to in the South by um, Southerners, usually black people. And those records were considered race records, um, I don't think many until the 50s, and even then it was more like these obscure record collectors who found all these cool old 78s, and they somehow made their way to England, and the British played with it, developed it, paid tribute to it, and then it came back here, and people like Muddy Waters, who played through the whole era from the 40s up until his death in the 90s, and people like Johnny Winter. Boy, am I just digressing all over. And now we have these blues festivals, and yes, there are a few genuine proponents, but so much of it to me 
is this it it doesn't have that real gut bucket i mean the millionaire guitar virtuoso just doesn't express the blues the way somebody who actually lived the lifestyle and i guess there are people still and there we don't all live this high class but there is no it's a different kind of blues maybe even country music used to be like down home and i know this is just some weird nostalgia and i am only seeing things from some odd looking back distortion and that's interesting too in its own way um just like you know the old comic artists who struggled and now I'm going to digress off into old comic artists. And they didn't make very money, but very much money, but they loved what they were doing. It was something they could do. And, oh, can you hear the cricket or is the noise reduction taking that out? It must be cricket season here. That'll be just lovely for sleep time. Oh, and that just, they're so loud. Maybe we'll have cicadas. Have you ever had cicadas? Anyways, um, the, the, the artists back then, like Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko, or who I'm going to speak about right now, uh, they did their work and they handed in their artwork and they weren't going to get their artwork back. It was stored in like closets and boxes and uh, slowly pilfered apparently um, when they finally went to court and legally got the right to have their artwork handed back to them people like jack kirby steve ditko all of the early creators whom without you wouldn't have the marvel universe i mean jack kirby uh created the avengers most of those characters came out of his and stan lee's imagination but the visual aspects, which that's the element of comics. Otherwise, it's just a magazine or a book or a story. And the excitement of it came right out of the pencil of Jack Kirby and the people who inked him. Because Jack Kirby worked so fast and had so much work to do, they, he would pencil everything out and somebody else would lay ink over his pencils. Because back then, I mean, now I believe... They can actually publish comics from pencil if they choose to. But back then, you had to then, I mean, very few people worked in ink. You had to lay things out, work everything out. And it's, it's strange to think of it that way with our modern digital capacities. There are people who, I would imagine, realize comics without any physical tools or paper or very little of it. But again, all this artwork was done. They finally won their court cases. And Marvel Comics was then obliged to go into their warehouses, sift through all this art. And yes, some of it went to the anchor. Some of it went to the person who wrote. But a certain percentage of this art was to go back to, say, Jack Kirby or Steve Ditko. And remarkably, and not unexpectedly, a great deal of it was just gone. And now it turns up and some of it's been recovered. But what they get for a page of art is as much as they would make in months and months of working. We've, the value of things just changes and shifts so much. And I don't even know what my point is. Well, one of my points is, yes, now I am doing this artwork and thinking, oh, Okay, I'm doing it. I'm enjoying doing it. People are asking me to show it. What, what do I ask for it? What is its value? Does it have value? Not really in any real sense. And it's just this ephemeral, just like these podcasts. I mean, do these have an actual monetary value? Um... It, it, these, that, I mean, now I'm just driveling and positing questions, but that seems to be what I'm doing, and that's what the appreciator is wondering 
right now, and I'm glad you're still with me. Um, oh, and now to completely digress, um, I've been playing this public domain music, and interestingly, um, when I posted on YouTube the episode with the Indian love call, it you know, oh, you the, the copyright, but the, the owner of the copyright says I can use it, and I can even monetize it, but they're still not setting up a mechanism, apparently, for stuff as it falls into the public domain, and probably would rather not, because, you know, I don't think these owners, they would rather come out with their own compilation and still get money for this old music from the few. I mean, how many people really listen to what I'm playing on these shows and say, wow, that's great. I want to get more of this and hear more of it. But it's music I can play and music I appreciate. And uh, that's the key in this show. For example, uh, next up here on this very broadcast to break this up because, yeah, I'm just talking in circles anyhow. And it might be nice to have a tune, don't you think? Um, let's hear... Waring's Pennsylvanians, a track called Just Hot. Now, uh, Fred Waring, who was the leader of this band, later invented uh, the Waring Blender, which I don't even think they make anymore, but that led to many good chocolate malteds. Not exactly as hot jazz as I was hoping for, but interesting, a little quaint and, I don't know, bouncy? And I like that music, but that, that that's not going to be added to my favorites. And I did a little research on Mr. Waring, and turns out the blender, uh, 
he financially backed it uh, uh, for an inventor named Frederick Jacob Osseus. And uh, the Miracle Mixer, it was called. And it was huge and it made a lot of money. And um, the wearing blender became an important tool in hospitals for the implementation of specific diets as well as a vital scientific research device. And interesting here, Jonas Salk used it while developing his polio vaccine. Now, that's interesting because the town that I live in uh, thrived because we have hot springs and people came here to get relief. Uh, apparently, the hot waters helped ease the discomfort of polio. And after that, uh, hot baths, while they came back, you know, in the form of hot tubs and sort of a health thing, I don't think it was ever quite the thing that it was in the 20s, 30s. I think the 40s uh, and post-World War II era was the boom era, especially when, you know, Ralph Edwards came here and we changed the name of the town to Truth or Consequences. Yes, this town was originally called Hot Springs, which some of you may not know. Um, but he stopped recording, according to this, in 1932. And I'm wondering whether that has something to do with... Uh, the share of monies that record labels would give their performers, because he continued to do radio shows uh, all the way from 1933 to 1957, and he developed uh, choral singers who would sing in unison or in groups uh, with his music. I, I'm not familiar with a lot of that stuff. That's not my mm -hmm. cup of tea. Uh, I, I like the pre-swing bouncy stuff more than I like the later stuff. Again, I, I just have this kooky specific taste in music for these like original versions and ideas and well, sometimes some mutations as with the Slim Whitman version of Indian Love Call, for example. Um, I, I, I'm a complicated yet simple man. And uh, speaking of like real time, uh, you probably can't hear it because of the uh, filtration and all the other sound going on, but up uh, that we now have a cricket who has taken residence outside my door and uh, all efforts to chase it away or uh, drown it out seem to be in vain. So I uh, it, 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 it'll be interesting to see uh, how and whether I can fall. Well, it, it's a distraction. Some people, you know, different things distract them from their sleep. And I will tell you the sound, the irregular rhythm, I think is what it is. And I can sleep with music. I can sleep with voices. But, but this high-pitched uh, trilling at various tempos is it daunting to say the least but I will I will make it and in fact uh, I take it as a challenge from PR News in Washington I'm missing and killed a fifth earlier this month 10 inches of Iraqi civilians dropped on Houston today a group linked to al-Qaeda in Iraq says it is kidding. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice says the same group says the U.S. military says the White House says PR News isn't over yet. On Wall Street, 345678. The Supreme Court has refused to say this is PR. The justices say plans pension pilots public pension plans PR's ports. Pensions pay pilots profitable pension pensions push pilots. Pension pension plan pension pilots pension plans PR's. For the first time in more than 20 years, whales have won a vote calling for resumption of PR news in Washington. Oh man, that's uh, Mr. F. Lemer, who uh, you may have heard on Fusebox if you listen to it. And I used to use him back in the day on older shows. And uh, I'd almost forgotten about him when I started doing these. And uh, I think this is a nice short 
goofy, surreal edition. And he does a different kind of audio collage than uh, I have demonstrated in uh, some of the earlier shows in the series. I really did all these things that I do as like some sort of artistic expression. There's just so many of them. And the ones that I feel other people can do better than me, I don't necessarily focus on, which probably isn't the best thing. I, I, it's, yeah, as you may be able to tell, I'm at some sort of uh, point where I need to make some real decisions for what I'm going to do with the remainder of this life. Because, um, yeah, we discussed fear last week, and that's really gotten me seriously thinking about the fears I've expressed. I am chugging along as I have, and, uh, you, you know, you go along with life, and you realize that maybe this is just heading full tilt off of some sort of precipice. I mean, if something... Ha well, I shouldn't fear that. If something should happen to my health, we deal with it then. But you start thinking ahead, and you wonder... What would I do? Let's say suddenly I became unable to hold a job and produce income. Do you just like go on? I guess that's what you do. You go into these social programs and you make the best of it. And you may have to live in some communal living situation with people you don't even know or necessarily like or get along with. And you just adapt. And I don't know. I, I also fear like this unknown, I suppose, going back to fear for a few moments here. Um, this, what would I do and what would it be like? And it's different. I mean, I, I am in and have been in a somewhat comfortable groove for, you know, I moved to TRC truth or consequences back in what 2007 uh, I started podcasting really with any functionality in around 2010 right here on the overnight scape underground but all the while in the back of my head I thought well someday maybe I could do this and it would I guess all podcasters have that and it's some sort of you seek some validation of outs and I get that I mean my peers seem to enjoy what I'm doing I get something out of doing it and I see that at times I really get a flow going and I feel good at the end of producing a program and that there's nothing better in a way than performing or like creating an audio collage and people like it or when I was doing music and people liked it but then we have this culture where you have to affix a value. And if it doesn't make money, then it's a hobby. It's superfluous and it has no genuine content or meaning. And yeah, the appreciator appreciates the opportunity to. I mean, the wonders of the internet allow me to do that for and frank paying for the hosting and the maintaining of all this and posting it on archive.org and to be honest i don't know where i would be podcasting i suppose i would like because it's free be doing it on youtube but i have not at all penetrated or a feel that i've gotten any sort of growing audience on youtube that just hasn't occurred. And I don't think it will. Uh, the people I see successful there, it's like really niche or it's very political. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to be this political pundit. Yes, the, the, the problems of an appreciator. And uh, we'll get back to the entertainium and the driveline because that's, that's just... That's just silly stuff. But uh, thank you for listening this time, and we will be back again 
very soon and until then, set the controls for the heart of the fun.